Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Malcolm Maestrell and I'm a membership services coordinator with IAAP. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Accessibility and Procurement, Sharing Innovative Solutions. Before we begin, we have a few general housekeeping items to go over. Closed captioning is provided. To enable closed captioning, select the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The stream text links for English, French, German, Spanish, and Swedish will be posted in the chat as well. Sign language interpretation is also provided. Microphones are muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. Please leave your questions in the Q&A. The chat will be monitored for general dialogue and technical issues. Today's webinar will be recorded and available in our webinar archives, and we will send out a copy of the recording to everyone who registered. And now I would like to turn today's program over to our moderator, Susanna Lauren. Thank you, Malcolm, and welcome to this uh, webinar, everyone. My name is Susanna Lauren. I'm the uh, IAAP and G3ICT responsible to the EU. And I'm sorry for my background today, but I am at my parents' house and it's really, really messy. <laughs> so um, for the translations, because this is an EU part of the EU series, uh, vous pouvez lire les sous-titres en français si vous suivez le lien fourni dans le chat. Sie können das auf Deutsch lesen, wenn Sie dem im Chat angegebenen Link folgen. Puedes leer el español si sigues en enlace provisto en el chat. Du kan läsa uh, texten på svenska om du klickar på länken som vi lägger i chatten. And that's the Eurovision of the IAAP webinar series. So I'm very happy today to welcome a very distinguished panel. Um, we have uh, Mike Gifford from Civic Action, a uh, close friend of mine uh, and long-term friend, I would say. We have been talking about procurement for I don't know how many years, and I'm really happy that we will now learn from what is happening uh, on the other side of the pond. Um, and uh, of course, we have the end user representation here with the mayor from uh, European Disability Forum, and we have a procurement specialist from the research arena also who has also been involved in the EN301549 standards since many, many years, Loic Martinez uh, from Spain. Uh, and we also have Andrew Nilsson from the uh, GSA, which is the General Service Administration in the federal level of the United States. So welcome everyone. Uh, we were hoping to also have a uh, policy officer from the procurement agency of one of the member states in Europe, but unfortunately we couldn't make that happen. But we have a very good panel uh, and very good content today, so I think we will be uh, doing a good job uh, anyway. So we'll start off with a short presentation about the situation in Europe, and then uh, Andrew and Mike will um, present the open um, ACR uh, project, and then we will have a short panel discussion and open for questions from the audience. So I forgot to make an agenda slide. I realize that now. But anyway, I'll try to, to share my little presentation. Uh, I hope I share my screen now. Yes, everything looks good. Yes, thank you. So. Uh, why procurement matters. Probably I don't need to tell you this because I think most of you who have signed up for something called procurement know why this is important, but still. Um, it is often said, but not always done in accessibility, that it's much easier and better and cheaper to get it right from the start. And when you mean, when you talk about getting things right from the start instead of kind of remediating afterwards, really, if you start even before you start building something or before you buy something and really start with the requirements in procurement, that is that is the starting point, I would say. So that is really, really important. It saves time for the for the buyer and also for the supplier who knows better what, what the, the buyer wants. And it also saves money because it's at least almost always true that it's cheaper to do the right thing from the start than, than kind of rebuilding it afterwards. I, at least I haven't seen an example on, on where it became cheaper to, to do the wrong thing first and then make it right. Um, and also from the end user perspective, and I guess also from, from kind of the e-government uh, perspective, it usually gets a better result. If you have thought about inclusion and making it usable and accessible from the beginning, that means that the, the 
product or service is usually working in a better way than kind of first creating something that doesn't work well for everyone and then putting a ramp on top of it that that is usually less less good quality uh, and also for procurers i think especially procurers in the public sector they really have or you really have uh, an enormous purchasing power and that means that you can influence the market you can have a real impact by using the procurement as a tool to kind of change the world so if every public sector body uh, starts uh, requiring um, accessibility kind of built in by default in everything they buy, then this will be the new normal and the market will absolutely follow. And because the public sector, at least where I come from, uh, does buy loads and loads of, of digital services, this really means something. It has a, it becomes a spillover effect also from the public, from the private uh, market if, if public sector kind of moves in the forefront here. Um, and also, I just had a, another webinar today explaining the EN301549 for monitoring agencies in, in the member states. Um, and, and okay, standards are difficult, but if you as a procurer think that it's difficult to understand the requirements of, of the legislation and the standards, then you can be sure that your supplier understands even less. So you need to, to focus on explaining why it is important and how, how you want things to be and what you mean when you say it should be accessible. I mean. It needs to be a little bit more clear than that if you want the supplier to deliver what you're actually asking for. And also, again, you can push the limits and really foster innovation by requiring maybe things that are not on, on the market today, but that is how we move forward. And that is how the industry is, is, is creating new things. So I personally think that procurement is such a, a good tool, both for kind of the here and now doing exactly what you're supposed to do with your new website or app or whatever you're buying, but also a way to kind of move things forward on, uh, on a more strategic level. So when we talk about the legal requirements in the EU, we have the procurement directive, which not so many people talk about, but it's a law uh, and it's a, a directive. So it, it means it has been transposed in all the member states. Um, and the Web Accessibility Directive, which everyone, I think, knows what it is, and the European Accessibility Act, which is the next generation legislation that will cover products and services, no matter if they are in the private or, uh, or public sector. And then we have the harmonized standards that uh, tells you what kind of exact technical requirements are, are, uh, are to meet to, for the presumed conformance. The procurement directive isn't that known because it's kind of a weak uh, legislation when it comes to the accessibility piece. But it something really fascinating happened in 2017 where the new version of the directive entered into force or was adopted. And that is something that uh, I think is worth um, mentioning because this is something that is pointing to the future. So in the old days, before 2017, the procurement directive said that when possible, <laughs> whatever you procure should be accessible to people with disabilities, more or less. So this was, this was not the exact words, but this is what it meant. So when possible, that is very easy to dodge. <laughs> and should means that may you, you know, you can do this, but you can also do something else. So before 2017, the procurement directive really, I mean, you could use it, but then you really had to want to do something accessible. You didn't get much help from the directive. In the new version, it says, when the procured item is going to be used by humans, meaning not machine to machine, shall, the requirements shall be taken into account for people with disabilities. So we took away the when possible and said when used by humans, which is kind of a nice thing. And we swapped the should to shall, which is just a word, but uh, as you probably know, this means a lot. So there is a big difference. And of course I have simplified this. Ooh, you can't do this with legal text. So I'll show you the right version. This is the new directive from 2017. It says like this, for all procurement, which is intended for use by natural persons, humans, whether general public or staff of the contracting authority. So fine, this is important because not only externally, but also staff can have accessibility requirements. That's good. And that's rather new as well to have that clarification. The technical specifications shall, except in duly justified cases, not only it wasn't 
possible, but you need to justify, be drawn up so that so to take into account accessibility criteria for persons with disabilities or designed for all users. So this is much stronger than it was before. And this is something you can really use when you procure, procure uh, products and services over the threshold. But the really interesting thing comes in the next paragraph where it says, where mandatory accessibility requirements are adopted by a legal act of the union, which means when we do have technical specifications in another law, the technical specifications shall, as far as accessibility criteria for persons with disabilities or designed for all users are concerned, be defined by reference thereto. Very legalistic language, but it means that the procurement directive is kind of waiting for something else to happen. <laughs> and that something is happening with the European Accessibility Act, because with that act, we have technical requirements, technical specifications for accessibility that will be presumed conformance for, uh, for that directive. And that means that the procurement directive uh, becomes much more enforceable or, or stronger. It's still the case that no one will kill you if you don't follow this. You won't go to prison and it won't, in most cases, it won't even cost you a lot of money. So the enforcement piece is, is still weak in the procurement directive, but this is something and that can be used and increasingly is being used by the member states. And that's really, really rewarding. And we have seen an increase in the use of uh, accessibility requirements in procurement since the directive came entered into force. So <clears throat> in the web accessibility directive and more or less in the accessibility um, uh, act as well, the the responsibility for kind of declaring accessibility lies on the procuring body. So the public sector body, in the case of the Web Accessibility Directive, needs to state their level of accessibility in an accessibility statement. Something similar will be also true for products and services uh, covered by the European Accessibility Act. And then the monitoring bodies at the national level in the EU, they, they monitor and, and surveillance have a surveillance activity to see that this is actually true, that the declaration is, is also followed by being accessible. And then the third pillar is, of course, the feedback and complaints from the users. But the statement is where the procuring body is not stating how the procurement was made, but the end result. So this is how we today do um, kind of conformance reporting uh, in, in Europe. It's really all the responsibility and kind of the action lies with, with the public sector body. And in the Accessibility Act, this will also be done by private actors, but still it's not the market, it's the buying organization that declares uh, its level of accessibility. So my question is, can we make life easier for procurers? That is my question. And to answer that, I ask Mike and Andrew to show us one possible way to make life easier and make the world a better place. And I don't know how many other positive things you will claim. Excellent. Well, well, thank you. Uh, uh, I guess since I since I spoke first, I'll I'll do I'll do a tiny bit of introduction uh, for us. Uh, so, so uh, thank you, Susanna, to, for 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 the introduction and, and for the invitation to be here today. Uh, so, again, my my name is Andrew Nielsen, and I uh, I'm the director of the government wide IT accessibility program in uh, the General Services Administration in our Office of Government Wide Policy. And, and a, a tiny a tiny bit more about me before uh, this before my current role and before I became a federal employee in the U.S. Uh, I, I supported the Department of Homeland Security and their Trusted Tester program, and uh, was uh, one of the primary co-authors of the Trusted Tester uh, manual testing process and the, the training program and content that, that uh, all of the, that goes along with that. Uh, so, so uh, in, in my, my apologies, uh, the, uh, I'm here today with, with uh, Mike Gifford, who, uh, whose, whose team developed this open ACR project for us. Uh, uh, the, uh, Civic Actions is not currently under contract with uh, with GSA, and so so Mike is is representing Civic Actions, uh, uh, and and that's but that's why we're here to, together today. Mike, Mike, if if you want to uh, give your introduction as well. 
Thank you very much, Andrew and, and Susanna. That was a lovely introduction to the whole issue of procurement and the challenge of, of uh, procurement as well. Um, I was ready to say, yes, let's just go with it. That's wonderful. And, and <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I joined Civic Actions a year and a half ago. Before that, I was the CEO of a company in Canada called Open Concept. I'm also a Drupal core accessibility maintainer. So I'm coming at this from a more technical view than, than many uh, people in the accessibility field. Um, also was, was really uh, happy to, uh, to work with Suzanne on the, on the We For Authors cluster project, which was uh, another uh, European Commission funded project to try and, and support uh, more systemic changes around access accessibility and make it easier for everyone to produce more accessible content. Um, but with that, I'm happy to, to jump onto the presentation. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, oh, Mike, you, why don't, sorry, you were going to give us the, the agenda and then I, and then I was going to oh, um, so, so we're going to cover um, why government needs machine readable uh, ACRs and ACRs are accessible conformance reports. We're going to talk about uh, open ACR and what, what it is that we've done. We're gonna, we've created some project goals. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the work that the GSA um, funded and that, that, uh, that Civic Actions put together with, in consultation with, with, uh, with others, and, and, uh, um, and then looking at, at uh, some of the progress we've made in that, and then, then have room for, for questions at the end, um, and through the panel as well, of course. Um, but go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, so I'm going to try and, and uh, go as quickly as I can get through my slides and, and turn it back over to Mike. Uh, to really get to the meat of, of what the open ACR is. Uh, but a, a, a little bit of background uh, in you know, the history of, of, uh, of procurement uh, for, of accessible products in the US. Uh, of course, we have a lot of parallels with the EU. Um, uh, but uh, in, the, in the US, there, there is uh, currently no, no law that directly requires private entities to make their digital assets uh, accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, in the Americans with Disabilities Act, it does require that private entities that provide places of public accommodation, that those places of public accommodation must be accessible in the physical space. And the prevailing interpretation uh, today is also that that applies to the same entities, the same private entities who provide physical places of com public accommodation, that, that their, their virtual or their digital places of public accommodation must also be accessible. However, it does not specify any any particular standard. It doesn't point to the Web Content, content Accessibility Guidelines, nor to the US Section 508 standards. And, but coming to that, this Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, a separate law, does require that, that all federal agencies purchase, build, use, or maintain accessible IT, and does point to uh, and require a, a, a specification of, of standards. Uh, what does it mean to be accessible? And, and, and the current version of, of section, the Section 508 standards, the additional regulation, points to WCAG 2.0, level A and level AA standards. Um, so this, that, that law has been in place uh, for over 20 years, uh, since 1999, and the standards became effective in 2001. Uh, and, but when, when US federal agencies started to, to ask product vendors about the accessibility of their products. There was a lot of variability in how they asked and what they asked for and how, how product vendors provided that. Uh, so in, in collaboration uh, between uh, US, US uh, government interests and uh, the IT Industry Council, the IT Industry Council developed a voluntary product accessibility template. That's a trademarked term um, and, and product that, that ITI developed. And, and that was a, a, a standardized method to to give information about the accessibility of, of vendor products. And, and that is widely used uh, in the US. Um, uh, procurement officers will often request, um, they may uh, request that, that vendors provide in the VPAT format an accessibility conformance report. And, and really the accessibility conformance report is just the output of, of a VPAT. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the VPAT format, it, 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 again, agencies may still ask for, for different formats and different methods of, of, uh, of demonstrating or, or communicating the conformance of their products. Um, but, but often it's probably, it's the most widely used uh, format. Um, you know, some challenge, we have some challenges with, with the, uh, the, the, the way that the, 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 the format of, of the VPAT or the ACRs as, as their output. 
Um, and we have challenges in, in getting access to that, that, that information. They aren't all, always posted publicly. Some, uh, of course, some, some vendors do post all of their information publicly. For some, uh, they, they might be behind. You might have to contact, uh, of course, a, a sales representative. Um, and, and, and they aren't always produced by, uh, by accessibility professionals. So sometimes they're produced by a marketing team the, to, to, uh, to speak to the accessibility of, the, of their products. Um, but, but again, often agencies will ask specifically for an ACR and, and, uh, and require that they are produced and using that VPAT template. Uh, Mike, let's go to the next slide. And I, I know I've already used way too much time, so I'll, I'll try to speed up. Um, but some of the challenges we have, have with ACRs um, is, you know, first in, in, the, the, in getting them, uh, and, and then um, the, the information that is in, in the ACRs is, is sometimes out of date. Uh, agencies may share, and once they get an ACR, may share that that, that ACR with other agencies. Uh, but they they may they may not update the information themselves, or or seek to to get an updated version. Um, and uh, and and even even once we have the information, uh, the the information itself is is sometimes the, the, there's kind of an, an, an endemic problem in the way that the, 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 that information is conveyed. Um, you might have, for instance, you might be able to, to, uh, to read that a product conforms or supports a particular standard. Uh, it, 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 it might uh, su support a particular uh, WCAG success criterion. Um, but there isn't much uh, you have to read read in the notes about the, the impact that might cause uh, for a person with a disability. And, it, and that makes it difficult to compare one product to another in a competitive bid um, or, or competitive selection. And, and, uh, and so uh, the, the other really main problem is, is that information in, in, in the ACR is still within a Word format, a Microsoft Word format or, or in PDFs. Uh, so the information itself is contained within, you know, a binary file. All of the data is mushed together, and it's hard to get that information out and share it separate from the document itself, which is also one of the reasons why it's it's difficult to keep the information updated, um, and 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 tie it to a particular version of a product. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, no no built-in feedback mechanisms to get clarity on the claims, and and uh, you know, to the point of of having that data inside of a, a Word document, while ACRs. Uh, and the VPAT is very much aligned to, to WCAG in terms of the, the standards. It, it, does, it does align to the WCAG 2.0 and 2.1 standards, uh, but, it, but it doesn't align to the, um, to, to the evaluation and reporting language uh, initiative under the Web Accessibility Initiative, nor to the EM reporting tool and, and, uh, and related uh, data schema. Uh, again, because the, the data is not machine readable. So, to solve some of these problems, not all of them, uh, and really as a stepping stone uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, better collect and share the data, we, we uh, started this project, uh, the, some of my colleagues at GSA started this project on, on an open ACR to create a machine readable version of the ACR. And, and Mike, my apologies for spending too much time, but, uh, but over to you. That, that, all that context is really quite useful. Um, so, uh, just to, to, on a high level, sort of what we've done, um, we created a, a standardized machine readable uh, accessibility conformance report platform that's built with a um, with a with a a, a, a structured uh, markup language called YAML. YAML's um, we found it a little bit easier than than JSON, which is a, another popular one. The WC3 went with JSON. We decided to go with with YAML, but they're interoperable in many cases. Um, they're very similar ideas, so uh, it's not a big deal in that that perspective. Um, we, we developed a, a collection of tools, but see that there's a, a lot more opportunities to go off and to support both the people who are generating the ACRs, um, as well as the people who are trying to use them for comparison or for, for knowledge gathering. Um, we want to, to look at, at uh, what was working well with the VPAT, because there was actually a lot that, that was working well in many instances in the VPAT, but we wanted to extend it and make, better, make that, those practices better and stronger. Um, we wanted to make something that was open source so that, again, it wasn't sort of trapped underneath one organization, but could be shared and manipulated and, and, and extended to go off and meet multiple needs for various different organizations. Um, we also saw this as being a, a, a very uh, a foundational piece for a, a comprehensive accessibility strategy. We are, we're not looking at 
Um, this as being a standalone project that will last in, in, uh, in isolation. This is something that needs to be part of, uh, of a whole workflow around procurement uh, and, and uh, making sure that, that you're able to, to, not even just after you, not even just when you bought them, but afterwards, like how do you try and make sure that the product that you bought two years ago um, is still meeting these accessibility guidelines that you need? Because there's going to be regular updates with anything that's on the internet. So we need to be, we need to have something that keeps up with with the um, the technology that is actively being used even after it's procured. Um, and, and we also wanted to make sure that the documents that are being produced, ideally they're things that can be shared so that you've got something that, that, um, that if you create an, an, an ACR that that document can clearly be shared with other people inside and outside the, the government. And so that, that it's not sort of being bound to the person who was, was submitted the report, that, that sharing is clearly outlined. Because um, that, that's something that's important for feedback, for managing that sort of the structured, a structured feedback process. Um, so we have a bunch of goals, trying to go up and make it transparent, make it uh, validatable, make it versioned, make it aggregable. We wanted to make sure that these are things that, that can be, um, that we can learn from and that we can build on. And, and so that there's, um, that we're adding to the process uh, for, for, the, for the in procurement um, and that we're not, uh, we're not creating uh, more legacy projects or legacy files, but having something that can be uh, can be built on, much like the the WK EM uh, report format is something that can be built on. Um, and it's, it's it's really interesting to see what what is being done when you have a whole series of of those reports and what you can gather from that knowledge. Um, and uh, to touch on on the the uh, what the GSA has done with the the Open ACR. Um, we've we've built something that is aligned with WCAG 2.1. Um, it, it initially was built for WCAG 2.0, but we also we extended it so that it could also cover 2.1, um, and we structured it in a way that it can also be extended to to uh, more easily support uh, multiple languages and also to be able to support the EN standard as well as uh, WCAG 2.2 when that gets out. We want to see this as being something that that there are multiple libraries that that can be built for this. But of course, that's something that needs to be extended. Uh, the initial scope of this project was very much focused on the the U.S. procurement structure and their, their regulations around Section 508. Uh, but it's very clear that BPAT has uh, has worked to go off and embrace an international approach, uh, and that's something that we'd like to to extend and build on so that it's easier for everyone to to have that that. Uh, um, a common global approach to to, to accessible technology. Um, we've uh, we've built in uh, Markdown and HTML into the YAML documents so that you can provide some formatting to that. So there's a limited amount of structure that's available within that. Um, and uh, we've we've reached out to to stakeholders in a number of of large uh, accessibility organizations and 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 people who are looking at at uh, at creating the VPAT structures already because there's a, there's already quite a large um, industry around the VPATs. Um, and we wanted to go off and make sure that the accessibility organizations that are part of that are on board with, with some of the changes that were proposed and, and got a, a quite a warm welcome from, from a, a great many of the leading accessibility uh, shops out there. Um, and we, we, we've built a, a fully functioning open ACR editor as well as some command line tools that make it easier for, for these, these tools to be not only, not only for somebody to create these reports, but to validate them, to make sure that, that the, the information is, um, if somebody sends you an ACR, that can be evaluated to make sure that, it, that, it, that, it, that it's, it's, a, it's a valid format, document format, uh, which again is something that, that isn't available within the, the, the VPAT structure. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we, we want to make this something that, that can be, be adopted outside of the US and, and support a you know, multilingual and, and international approach to this as well. But that's, that is yet to be, be built so far. It's, it's an English only document or, or English only editor. And, and we've built in English assumptions because that was the primary use case for our particular, for, for, for this particular project. Um, so this is a, a screenshot of, of a YAML comparison to an HTML comparison. Um, if, you, if you look at, at a, a report that's generated from OpenACR, it looks very much like a, um, a current VPAT report that you've seen, um, but the text, uh, the, the YAML document format is, is just a highly structured, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not that human readable, but it has all that information in the very structured stru format. Um, 
And we have the, the editor here and you can, you can actually, um, I can actually show you what that, that editor looks like um, because we, we can go through and, and um, edit it. And, and again, it's, it's, it's built on um, essentially the, the WKEG EM tools. Actually, we actually use the, the ATAG tool that uh, Hedy DeVries went off and implemented with the WC3. Um, but you can uh, choose whether you want to use the, the VPAT 2.0 or the 2.1. Um, and there's a catalog structure that allows you that, that will, will, will organize the, the, the structure of the questions um, and allow you to, to jump through all of the uh, WKEG success criteria. Um, and again, section 508 focuses on, on um, you know, hardware, software, documentation. Um, and then you can download the, the format, download the report both as an HTML and a YAML document together as a zip file. Um, but also to try and, and download it just as the, the YAML file if you want it to be able to, to, to store um, just the, the machine readable uh, ACR. And with that, I think that's, that's probably enough of a, a basic introduction to, to what we've, we've implemented. Um, you can reach out to Andrew and myself here, um, but happy to, to carry on the conversation from, from here. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Mike. Uh, so we got a, a question that is specifically on this uh, presentation. Can you elaborate on the validation layer bullet? So maybe we can take that first, just if you wanna. So there's, there's a, um, this is all written in JavaScript and there's a machine, um, a machine readable, um, this machine readable code that, that allows us to, um, to, to evaluate that, that the, the content of a YAML file aligns with the, uh, the schema that, that was implemented. Uh, we, we actually took some of the best practices from uh, NIST, which is a US government agency, and they had a format called OSCAL, uh, which I can't remember the, off the top of my head what OSCAL is, but it was a security framework. And uh, that allowed uh, a, a way to, to create a, uh, a, a, a JSON schema document that allowed us to, to, to build a validation on that and, and have a um, build certain rules into the command line, into a command line validator that allowed us to say, does this meet all the, all the criteria or not? And, and to have a, have a simple command line um, implementation of this. Uh, we would like to go off and build that into something that is a simple um, uh, web-based tool that allows somebody to simply upload a, a YAML file and to validate that. Uh, but you can also um, just upload a, uh, a YAML file to the OpenACR editor, uh, just like you can with WKEG EM, and, um, and that has validation built into the editor as well. So you can, you can view and, and, and uh, get that validation simply by using the editor. Yeah, so, so someone you know, very technically capable could could, of course, just uh, build their report straight in YAML, um, and that and that's what the you know where the validation tool comes in comes in handy. Um, you can validate uh, just via command line interface just the the YAML file, or I think as as Mike mentioned uh, the, that last point that if you upload it to the uh, or if you, if you import it uh, into the OpenACR editor, there's validation built in, and 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 so of course if you use the open the editor uh, to to create the the ACR the OpenACR report. Um, it will, of course, be in, in, in the correct data, data schema, and, and, and again, validation uh, occurs as part of, uh, naturally as part of that. Yeah, all of the big uh, accessibility um, vendors who, who create VPATs right now um, do have, a, have, an, have their own system for managing the workflow and to be able to produce the PDF reports that are, uh, or the Word reports that are, that, are, that are used for the VPAT. And this is a, a way of just saying, well, you can, you can take that process and create a YAML file instead. Um, and use that that your your existing structure to produce one, and then then we can validate that that is is, is a valid structure even if you haven't used our, the editor that was produced as part of this project for creating the the, uh, uh, the ACR. So I have a, just a short question before we move into the panel. So if uh, did is does this exist in real life? I mean, did is it tested and is it used already, or is it more like a? It it, uh, it it currently is is published on, on a GitHub Pages site uh, plan. Um, uh, we it, it's still prototype uh, con considered prototype, but it's it's a very much a working prototype. And the reason still we're, you know considered a prototype is is because we 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 still want to to get input and feedback and and uh, and we have engaged with some of our industry partners. 
Uh, but we still, I think we still need to continue to engage with them. Uh, and, and so we haven't yet moved it to uh, a formal, uh, I mean, it is in production, it's live uh, at, the, at the link that, that Mike provided, um, but, but we haven't published it on section 508.gov, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that again is, is really uh, because we, we, you know, we want to build uh, you know, the goodwill with our industry partners and, and, uh, and internally uh, with, with our, our other federal agency, US federal agency partners as well. So it's up and running and working, but but still considered a uh, prototype at the moment, and, and you know, but, and we we also still need to secure funding to to make additional updates. Yeah. Okay, so I want to turn to our European panelists and ask you after this. Um, short uh, presentation of, of the idea, but I know that you have also uh, read a little bit about it before, so do you th what's your uh, impression if we start with the. Um, the um, the research piece here, Loic, um, what do you think? Do you think something like this could be useful for the EU? I mean, it's it's kind of the other way around than what we are trying to to do in Europe, but still um, still something that is sometimes uh, discussed at different. Okay, levels. so from my quite long experience with the. European standard and the history of it, which was initially related to probably procurement. Uh, I think this kind of tool is essential from the procure, procurement viewpoint. I mean, as they have perfectly explained, you need a way to check, uh, to store, to check versions and, and, and to be able to know um, what people declare are their own um, accessibility features. It's like the accessibility statement in a machine readable format so you can work with it and create a catalog and it could also might for instance what you explain about the web accessibility directive we do have our uh, member states monitoring the progress on that um, if they could have access to this accessibility statement in, in a machine readable format they could use that as a basis for even checking i mean i i know the spanish effort as i'm in spain um, I know they have an, an automated tool to do the, the monitoring, but they could check the results from the monitoring tool to the accessibility statement uh, if both were like machine readable. So I think it's a, an extremely useful proposal. Um, and I like it a lot. So thank you for the effort. Um, can I have a question? <laughs> to of Mike course. Uh, and Andrew, um, can you briefly, and of course we don't have much time, but could you briefly explain how you think the uh, modification for um, support EN 309, I mean, the EN would be? So, so I think that's a technical one, so I'll, I'll jump on that. So we've, we've structured this so that there's multiple catalogs available for different standards. So, um, so we can create um, a, a catalog that would, would map to the EN 301.549 standard. Um, or which version of the EN 301.549 standard, right? And, and be able to, um, to, to update that over time so that there's, there's, a, um, there's a structure. And, and so you'd have multiple different catalogs. And, and um, I showed briefly that you could jump between WCAG uh, 2.1 and 2.2 in the demo, um, and it would be the same process. Uh, we would simply go off and, and say, um, you know, what, what would you want to, what is the, the what kind of report are you looking to build? Is it just for the US? In which case the section 508 one is, 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 is better. Is it just for the web? In which case, you know, let's, let's aim for a WK 2.1 or 2.2 standard and, and minimize the, the, the process. Um, but, uh, but, you know, partly it's to try to make sure that there's there, that we're guiding the people who are writing these reports so that they have as much support as they can to, to produce a meaningful ACR. Yeah, and, and if I were just to speak to that, I, I don't want to say it's a trivial matter, but it's a, it really is a, a fairly simple process of, of adding a catalog to the to the data schema. Um, it's a little bit more effort to, of course, to to then modify the front end, the editor, um, to to accommodate that. Uh, but but also want to make clear that you know the, both of these projects, the the data schema itself, the Open ACR da data schema, and the editor, both are in GitHub. Um, they're you know so open source and and, uh, and it, you know, I'll take the chance right now to, to it, we, we're totally open to collaborating, um, fork the project that, you know, and, and, and modify them yourselves or collaborate with us. And, and we're happy to entertain um, 
you know, questions and issue, issues and, and, uh, and, and, and as we secure funding to move, to move forward, if, you know, if we, if we do have broad support, then, and we can, we can justify that, then, then, uh, then we can certainly collaborate on, on additional improvements. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's, that's kind of the, the not so hidden agenda with this, <laughs> with this webinar, I think, is to try to, to make sure that we get some interest and, and can move forward on that. So if we move to the end user perspective here, Mayor, what do you think? Uh, I mean, there is always a, a question of, of um, whenever you declare something accessible, no matter how you do it, there's always a question of how much, how much use it is it for the, from the user perspective and mm -hmm. do people tell the truth and <laughs> such things, but do you have any reflections on the, on the need for, for this, both, both in the kind of uh, web accessibility directive uh, yeah. ecosystem of statements, but also in procurement. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I want to say a small disclaimer that I'm not a technical expert. So my, my view on the technical side of the, of the tool uh, will, will be very limited. So I will comment on more of the policy issues that uh, we see in the implementation of EU uh, legislation on public procurement or accessibility, there is definitely still a gap in uh, monitoring and, and reporting. And I think this kind of tools can, can help also the, to that process for the EU and also for the member states. Uh, but I don't think, uh, you know, just to optimize this kind of processes is the, is the one and only, only solution. I think this kind of solutions can be additional to, to what is also, or also in place in the EU. Um, also, you know, because you need a lot of qualitative information and also con consulting users to see if actually uh, the outcomes are, are meeting their, their needs. Um, so definitely, I think as, a, as an aim and as a, uh, with its objectives, it's, it's, it sounds like a very useful uh, idea, but uh, to concretely say, um, um, final uh, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, if, if we should use it, uh, I cannot really comment. No, it, it was more if it's interesting. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's quite so interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but but what are so now we are talking about something very specific. But this is this is really just one or maybe two pieces of of this puzzle. So, so what are the kind of the main barriers or the challenges? Why why don't we see procurers kind of solving the accessibility issues from the start? What is what are we struggling with, or what are the procurers struggling with? What you know, if we kind of Look a little bit broader than than just this uh, this initiative. What what would you say, Mike? What's the what's your clients struggling with? Why are they not always requiring full accessibility from everything? I think that the the um, the, the, the big challenges is that that it's this is something that that there aren't that many accessibility subject matter experts in government who are doing this this job, and that the 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 procurement officers are under a great deal of pressure to go off and to get go through a lot of different contracts and this is just often a bullet point which is in the contract and they throw it in or they and there's necessarily the support that they need to be able to quickly make a decision and and so so it comes down to the lowest common denominator and often a procurement officer will will uh, will have to go off and evaluate some some bids and they'll you know, they'll say you know does is there a vpad for these these documents and or do they say it's accessible and um and then the, the sort of a check mark to say yes the, the vendor claims is good so therefore we'll accept that um because they don't have any this time or the skills to go off and to do anything else uh, but but by having a machine readable document, we could actually start to look at building a comparison tool that would support the the um, uh, the process, both in terms of of making sure that the um, that when the contracting or the procurement language is being drafted, like uh, the GSA um, and the DHS have created some really interesting tools to try and help form the the uh, procurement process with it's it's, uh, it's uh, art the uh, Accessible Resource Toolkit is that is that right, Andrew? It was well, it's, it's accessibility requirements tool to help to help uh, procurement officers, requiring uh, officials, generate solicitation language to put in their 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 solicitations. And, and that's 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 a wonderful piece, but then that could also be turned into something that's machine readable. That that could then, at the end of the point, you could you could bring in your your machine readable um, requirements documentation, 
and combine that with your your uh, your the ACRs that you you've gotten from your uh, from your vendors and be able to say I just want to look at the information that's relevant for me. This is a web ex web specific project, so I'm not interested in hardware. I'm not interested in in these other elements. This is exactly what I need. I need it to be WK 2.0. So just show me that information that will allow me to make the decision um, based on what I need. And, and and so much of the time it's like. It has the has the the VPAT been written in the last two years? Because if it's not, you know, at least if it's not written in the in the last year, it's probably not relevant. Um, but that's not something the procurement officers are even guided on how to to use. So, Loic, I know you and your uh, students have worked on on tools and and ways of of uh, trying to support procurers. Do you want to say something about what you have discovered in in those processes, more from a research or very practical hands on research? But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, we're in the middle of it. Um, there, there's not much we can we can say. We we sent a survey to people to to gather information about what people were interested in, know more about the EN, uh, uh, what they what uses they made of the EN, and and for which purposes and which things they needed more and, and less. Uh, we are prototyping ideas and checking them. Uh, the work is not real research is like is a master's thesis and we expect to have something by by summertime uh, as the student will have to present it whatever he has achieved so by that time we will be able to share um, the results and the information so currently it's just an ongoing activity um, we were mostly exploring ways of helping people i mean taking into account what happened at the first version of the toolkit that we had for the end in the old days, um, to try to explore different ideas of, of uh, ways of supporting people to better know and use the EN. So we made questions, we, we have gathered that information, we've done some prototypes of, of supporting web pages that could uh, show people how to, I mean, it's like Annex E in the current version of the EN, but in a different way and formatting and we are still exploring it. So whatever we get into, we will share with, with the joint working group, of course, with the people behind the end, but it's still a little bit early. Um, uh, just he, the student is just uh, finishing some usability testing of, of low fidelity prototypes. So we, we're starting shaping the, the ideas. Uh, we will need that to do that. But I mean, ACR could be something a, a little bit different uh, because of uh, as a supporting tool for machine, whatever processes you can do, as Mike has said, this uh, very important um, task of comparing two offers and, and look at the different accessibility uh, value offered by the, the proposals. Like that's that's like essential. It's it's not that for understanding, but our, our, let's say basic use of 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 uh, any standard in, in a procurement process. Um, so it's, it's on a different layer, it's a different kind of support. So the two could be compatible completely, of course. And for those of you who hasn't been in the bubble of the EN standard and mandates since forever, like Loic and I have, uh, there was in the in the first, in the original mandate 376, there was also, the, we were, we, somebody built a, a toolkit for, for the EN. Uh, so that was kind of a, a support tool for, for procurers, but that doesn't exist any longer, and many people want it to to come back, or in maybe in another format. So I think there are there are several initiatives trying to to produce something um, something useful for this. But uh, from the end user perspective, the policy policy from EDF. What do you say, uh, Mayor? What what are the barriers or challenges? What why is this why is this still in, why are we still discussing procurement? <laughs> I mean, we have done this for a long time. Uh, why didn't we solve this already? Yeah, I mean, again, just general, like when we see um, implementation of EU accessibility legislation, I think one of the one of the gaps is in also that people don't know what accessibility means. And to an extent now, the Accessibility Act, of course, solved that with its beautiful annex uh, with all the great requirements. And then, of course, the standards that will be harmonized for it. So this is partially, uh, at least from a theoretical point of view, it should be solved. But at the end of the day, we also see that even when we have this, um, not everyone knows about it. Like people are not aware of the existence of the of the legal uh, requirements and of the standards. So I agree with what uh, with Mike said, I think is that there's a lack of accessibility professionals, especially um, in public authorities that procure services. 
uh, we've seen very kind of big uh, public kind of um, you know cases when it comes to artificial intelligence. You might know the case of um, in the Netherlands procuring AI technology for uh, assessing fraud and childcare provision. So these kind of issues were the result of the authority not being able to uh, know how to use the system or know know the flaws of the system. I think we don't see so many kind of um, big examples on media about accessibility, but this is also true. Uh, you know, people are not uh, well trained or, or aware enough to, to know how to apply the standards, what to require. So you have also shortage of staff, shortage of expertise. Um, therefore, I mean, it's very important to, to build on uh, the pool of accessibility professionals and ensure that this is an expertise provided in public authorities and not also just to have like one person that does multiple things uh, that doesn't have the time to check actually all these, if all these requirements are, are met. Yeah, yeah. there's so many different pieces to uh, procurement that could be made better. And what we all often see in our research is that even though there are, there may be a kind of accessibility ambassador or champion or something in the in the authority usually uh, working with communication or something like that they do mm -hmm. know quite a bit of accessibility but then the procurers are somewhere completely different and they mm -hmm. don't seem to talk to each other so so the, the procurers are, are you know not aware and and then the i don't know why this is why they are not communicating in a good way but but that i, I think is also such a pity because it's it's should mm -hmm. be so some of or these some things should be kind of yeah yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, there's also sometimes we see that maybe certain, um, like, a, you know, at policy level or, or staff level, lower technical level, people are committed, they want to, to improve things, but there is no political will, will at the, like the higher level of the organization to, to ensure enough uh, resources and funding uh, to support this development. So it's different uh, issues. Yeah. Yeah. True. So we could talk about this another hour, but but <laughs> we said we will have a short Q&A, so we took some questions, but there's something recurring here with um, if there will be a repository of complete ACRs that vendors supply. So uh, is that something you think about building a repository around this or? It, 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 so in the US, we've, we've had discussion um, about a common repository of ACRs for, for quite some time. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, we've had discussion about uh, a common repository of independent test results. Both are, are I think, uh, you know, we, we still desire. Um, without presupposing the solution, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a, a repository. It could be a, a separate indexing, um, uh, for instance, of, of, of ACRs that that vendors could host on their own sites or, or, or you know, via multiple methods. Um, but, but yes, uh, we, we uh, so currently no firm plans to build a, 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 a repository, but that is, that is a, a future goal. Um, and I'm currently in the process of, of, uh, of securing funding to, to, to potentially to do that. Um, but, but again, it could, it could be a re repository, it could be an indexing, um, that will be part of our exploration of a of, of possible solution. Um, but you know, since I mentioned, you know, repository of ACRs and, and a repository of independent test results, that's, that's also another, uh, you know, possible extension of the open ACR data schema um, to, to also uh, extend it to, to include or to accommodate potentially independent testing and, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, further exploration of, of, uh, of alignment with the, the WIC IBM uh, reporting tool um, or, 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 you know, something in between that can help us bridge the gap between the, the you know, uh, some of our U.S. standardized uh, reporting methods. And, anyways, uh, so, so yes, yes and no. Yes, hopefully, uh, repository. Um, uh, no plans at the moment to build it, but, but, but hoping to and uh, and and attempting to to secure funding for that. Yeah, and I should also add to Mir's point about, or Loic's uh, point about uh, machine readability of the accessibility statement in the EU. Uh, there are some member states who do um, check for the val validate the accessibility statements uh, to their monitoring, their manual monitoring as well. Not all, but some do. And there are also some member states who do provide uh, kind of centralized systems for the accessibility statements that are uh, then machine readable as well. So that that is done in in many different ways. And I think we are just kind of moving out of the first monitoring period of the web accessibility directive. So I think there will be also sharing of best practices and probably 
uh, more things like that being developed in different member states and, and maybe shared or, or, or stolen <laughs> uh, by others or, or even built into the next version of the regulations. So we have another that, question. Sorry. Yep. Oh, my apologies. I, I, uh, you, you, know, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, what is keeping uh, product vendors from uh, from sharing the, or, or from signing on to to uh, to support the open ACR or 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 having already done something like this to to provide the information in, in a in a in a more easily shareable uh, format and 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 uh, you know certainly uh, I can't speak for uh, product vendors but but certainly have you know heard some of their uh, some of their feedback and concerns and and uh, you know one of which is you know taking away the um, uh, some of the personal interaction you get from from sales, from sales interaction, um, and 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 then also you know kind of ownership of, of the information and data and and, and uh, ensuring that uh, that they have control over that information and and so that's something we you know we certainly want to be sensitive to is in, in particular if we were if we were to host a, a common repository um, and so so those are some of the concerns that that you know we would need to address and 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 help overcome um, uh, you know protecting uh, the the product vendors uh, ownership of of information. And, uh, and and helping to facilitate that information sharing at the same time. Um, so anyway, sorry, just wanted to kind of sp speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm I'm more kind of on the procurer side here. <laughs> I think the market will cope with whatever we do, and they should. Uh, so and and I mean the, the problem I see with VPATs is that they are not true. Uh, so uh, we we need to kind of fix that if we want to use something similar uh, in Europe. So. Um, so there are many uh, questions, So, uh, but one thing I thought was interesting was, are there any fields coded as required fields, or will you make some of the fields required fields? For example, the evaluation methods used included a description of evaluation methods used to, a com to complete the VPAT for the product under test. This is one usually missing from many file VPATs. I think that's an interesting idea. Is that something you have thought about? So, so we haven't, um, we, we intentionally built it so that it would be as easy as possible for people to, to take existing VPATs and convert them over to an open ACR format. And so we wanted to make sure that, that the initial release of this had as, as few constraints as possible so that there was, there wasn't a, um, there were, there's as few uh, barriers to entry as we can. But we also see that the, there's an importance to go off and to see the, the editor and the standard evolve over time. And so that means we trying to go off and provide additional guides to, to help encourage uh, vendors to, to implement better practices, uh, but also to start putting in required fields so that people are, are having to, to look at uh, providing better, better information. Um, and even things like, um, like the, the open document structure, um, that's something that we're, we're, we're pushing as a, a, as a best practice, but you don't have to adopt that. You can choose a proprietary, if you want your, your open ACR to be proprietary, that's something that you can do as well. So if, you, if, you, if, if for whatever reason you choose, you don't want to share, that is an option. Um, but, but the default is we're trying to go off and set what we, what we would like it to be. Uh, but the document structure is, is designed to evolve over time to include practices uh, like this so that we can we can help guide the the, uh, the the people writing these reports and have greater consistency about them. As far as the concerns about how valid these statements are, one of the things that we're we're hoping to be able to do with open ACR is just to have a way for people to to write a comparable statement. So if 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 uh, let's say Microsoft produces a um, an open ACR about uh, about SharePoint and about SharePoint's accessibility. Um, lots of government agencies have done reviews of SharePoint's accessibility. It would be nice to be able to take the report that OpenACR or that, that Microsoft has generated and then to build on that and say, well, we found these issues and these are some problems that we've identified. Even just to be able to take that and send it back to Microsoft and say, here's, we, we, this is what you've reported and this is what we found. So please add that, fix these issues, but also add this to your, your, your own open ACR in the meantime. We've shared this internally with our, uh, with our, our, our vendors, so that, or with other people in our, our agency, um, but we'd like this to be reflected in, in your, your, uh, uh, your ACR in the future. So you can do things like that to try and, and engage a conversation. Yeah. So that's one of the pieces that I really like with this idea, because if somebody would take it on and build a, something, useful in, in Europe, that would be also uh, adding to transparency. And I mean, 
it could really be a very useful tool. So I think from, from many different perspectives. So time flies. We have loads of questions that we didn't, uh, that we weren't able to answer. Um, I hope and think that Mike and Andrew will be happy to answer them um, after the webinar in writing, uh, or maybe I'm just uh, promising things that is not true, but, <laughs> but hopefully, uh, and Malcolm will uh thank the uh, interpreters and do the the short wrap up but thank you for joining us today thank you to the panelists uh, i hope we can get back to this this very interesting topic later on because procurement has always been something that i think we need to just uh, it's a key key topic that we need to do more about but malcolm you have promotion to make thank you First, I want to thank Mike, Andrew, Mayer, and Loic for such a wonderful and informative presentation. I also want to thank our moderator, Susanna, sign language interpreter, Beth, and captioner, Heather, for upcoming IAAP EU events. On June 2nd, we have the European Accessibility Summit side event. The link to the event page will be posted in chat and registration will be opening shortly. For anyone who is not a member of IAAP, you can email info at accessibilityassociation.org to inquire about membership. Thank you again to all of the panelists and our support team. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. Bye.